out this way. Uh, please uh, help me then by answering a couple of uh, questions, if you will. First of all, the book of Hebrews was written to the Hebrews. <laughs> Very good. That's extremely important. So when I come to this book, I need to be able to look at it through the eyes of a first century Hebrew. I need to glance at it. I need to look at it through the lens of the Hebrew understanding of the Old Testament. They did not have the New Testament yet through their understanding of the Old Testament. And another very, very important question which I would ask you is, uh, should I or anyone ever approach the scriptures with preconceived notions, or should we just let the verses speak for themselves? Of course, you know that. We should just let the verses speak for themselves. If I have a particular theology that differs from a particular passage and what it is saying, which one should yield the right of way? My preconceived notion and my theology or the verse? The verse always takes the right of way. Uh, if theology does not agree with the Bible, then pitch the theology out. Jesus, uh, look, here's what's going on here in this book. Uh, the writer is trying to get, for all intents and purposes, the listening Hebrews to leave Judaism. That's what he's trying to do. Look, here's what uh, Jesus did not bring a Judaism reformation. That is not what he did at all. He did not bring a blending of something old and something new. What he brought was a brand new covenant. A brand new agreement between God and man. Made possible by his sinless life, his substitutionary death upon the cross for our sins, and his resurrection from the dead. Listen to what Jesus said in Luke chapter 6. Then he spoke a parable to them. Here's Jesus. No one puts a piece of from a new garment on an old one. Otherwise, the new makes a tear. And also, the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled out, and the wineskins will be ruined. That's Jesus. These Hebrew Christians who had put their faith in Jesus Christ were being rejected. I don't know if you felt some rejection before, perhaps by family or friends, once you gave your life to Christ. They're being persecuted by some of their own family members. As a matter of fact, they're being counted as dead. How would it feel if you went to your family and said, I gave my life to Christ, and then the very next day they're holding Shiva which is the Jewish rite of when somebody dies, they're there praying for your death when that happens. That's what was happening to these Hebrews who had professed faith in Jesus Christ as Messiah. And apparently it had caused some of them then to reject Christ and to return to the old covenant rules and sacrifices and traditions. A place of total rejection of Jesus Christ and the cross. Not interested, not having it. I'm going back to the old way of living. And the writer is saying, don't let that happen to you. Let me kind of translate it for our help then. Believer, do not leave Jesus Christ for anyone else or anything else, period. Outside of the gospel of grace available through Jesus Christ, there is, well... There is nothing else. There is only one name given under heaven by which we must be saved. That's the name of Jesus Christ. Apart from Christ, you're on your own, buddy. So the first two verses are very, very Jewish. And don't try to make them, quote-unquote, Christian, because they're not. 
And remember, the writer's trying to explain to them from previous, because he starts out with therefore, He's trying to explain to them all the blessings they have with Jesus as their high priest. So you sit in front of a bunch of Jews and you say to them, Oh, by the way, I just thought I'd let you know, your new high priest is Jesus Christ. Oh my goodness, what reaction might you get? But that's what he's trying to tell them. He knows that that's a sticking point for them. Look at verse 1 again. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Another word for perfection is maturity. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. He's kind of like saying to them, Gang! Hebrews! And this is taking place sometime between 60 and 70 uh, A.D. Uh, the temple is still there. They're still a high priest. They're still offering sacrifices. They're still keeping the feast days. They're still doing all of the ceremonial things. There is no New Testament for them to look through. And they get this, and he's saying to them by verse 1, he's saying this, Hey gang! We are now past all of that. All the, entr all the elementary principles that God's sending a Messiah. We all know that. We're past anybody saying, what does it say about the Messiah? What's he like? Who's he going to be? Where's he going to come from? All that talk about the Messiah is all past us now. So he says, let's go on to maturity. The, the Messiah is Jesus. Church family, let me ask. Because this is asking him to go on to maturity. Have you ever prayed, Lord, help me stop doing dumb stuff? <laughs> ever prayed that? It seems like the more I get mature in the Lord, the more I know about Him, the more I grow up in the Lord, the more I pray that. Oh, Lord, help me stop doing dumb stuff. Help me to go on to maturity. Look, we all do dumb stuff, don't we? We all make mistakes, just plain old flat out mistakes. Where we like, I meant to do my best, I was trying, I don't know how that happened. We all missed the mark. Not only that, but we're all, all often selfish, aren't we? Sometimes we let anger cloud the waters of our relationships with others. But guess what? God still loves you. God still has his plans for you. He is faithful even when we're not. He wants you to grow up. He wants me to grow up. And to that I say, Amen, Lord. Well, that's the whole thing. Let us go on to maturity. But uh, this next part is kind of interesting. It says, Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. Um, a lot rode on the back of of good works for the Jew. A lot. In fact, it still does. In fact, if you talk to a Jew today, every year they have one big hope. <laughs> and their hope is that they've done more good than bad. That's what the hope is. But let me ask you, even as nice as that is, does doing good get you into heaven? Is there enough good that you can pile up in order to get to heaven? There is not. It is faith in Jesus, in his finished work on the cross of Calvary. Don't you love it that Jesus has done so much for us? Talk about a radical, that's Jesus. Talk about somebody who went absolutely against the grain, that was Jesus. Talk about somebody who looked at the establishment and said, you guys are out to lunch. Now come and get what I have for you. It's better than anything you can find out. That's Jesus. That's what Jesus says to you and to me through his word every single day. Not you're condemned. It's come and get life. That's what he says. So, look at verse 2. He wants, them to get, he wants the Hebrews to get past this. Hebrews, get past the doctrine of baptisms. Get past the laying on of hands. 
get past the resurrection of the dead in general, that will happen sometime, and of eternal judgment. Look, even the word baptisms that's used here, that's not the same Greek word that's used for baptism when we receive Christ after salvation and get baptized. Look, the only reason we get baptized is not to be saved. Baptism doesn't save anybody. But what baptism does is it shows that we're willing to be obedient to God. God says get baptized, so guess what? I'm getting baptized. (laughs) And also, it's our big opportunity to show everybody. Open display. I'm getting dunked because I believe in Jesus. I believe in his death, burial, and boom, resurrection. That's who I am now. This word, baptisms, notice it's plural, is only used here. It's a Greek word. It means instruction about cleansing rites. That's what that says. It's taken from the books of Moses. They had a number of different washings and cleansings and steps that they took and then they washed again and rituals that were totally unknown. These baptisms are not known to Gentile believers. The majority of us don't know about them today. Just a little bit, we know about it. So leave baptisms. Uh, He uh, also says of laying on of hands. They don't have the New Testament. They don't know anything about laying on of hands to receive the Holy Spirit. Or uh, Here's what they, when you'd say to a Jew, laying on of hands, what do you think they think of? They know this. When they brought a sacrifice to the temple to have their sins forgiven, they would lay their hands on the animal, showing that their sins were passed from them to the animal. The animal was then sacrificed. That's what they see when they see this laying on of hands. Of the resurrection of the dead. Yeah, we believe that eventually sometime God will work it out and everybody will be raised from the dead and they'll all be judged. He's saying, those are are elementary things to us, fellow Hebrews. Let's get past that. We know who Christ is. We... We, these cleansing rituals don't make you holy. They don't make you righteous. Look at verse 3. And this we will do if God permits. I read that and I think that's the writer's prayer. Lord, these people that I'm talking to about going on to maturity, Lord, let us go there. Lord, permit it. Bring it. Allow each one that's hearing your word now to go on to a full maturity in Christ. Verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame. So there you go. Thank you very much for listening this morning. God bless you as you go out. <laughs> like I know a pastor in Northern California who was teaching through the book of Hebrews and when he came to chapter 6 he struggled so much that he announced to his church, we're going on to another book. And he just left it. G. Campbell Morgan. Brilliant man. His pastors all over the world have given him this title. The Prince of Expositors. Because he's so clear and, man, he just brings it. Well, here's what uh, G. Campbell Morgan did in his own commentary on the book of Hebrews. He got to chapter 6, he got to these verses, and he said nothing. He just skipped right over it. So this morning, uh, to prove to you that those two guys are indeed smarter than I am, uh, I'm going to rush in (laughs) where angels fear to tread. By the way, if in my just reading these verses, if it should if you should happen to be doing something that you shouldn't do, and you've been feeling heavy conviction of the Holy Spirit that that's now how God wants you to live, I just thought I'd let you know. I'm okay with that. 
<laughs> I say, great. If you're, look, one of the ways in which God keeps us on track is with warnings in the Bible. Have you noticed that? <laughs> the Lord likes to do that a lot with warnings, keeps us on track. And I appreciate the fact that there is just enough tension in some of the warnings that it makes us stop and should make us stop and it should have us saying, do I indeed know God? Am I indeed forgiven of my sins? Do I properly understand the gospel? And when I hear something like, he who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son of God does not have life, I immediately want to know, do I have the Son? That's what these warnings are for. Do I have the Son? And more importantly than that, does He have me? Is it a reality in my life? Here we go. <laughs> I want to start out by saying this, that the writer begins to distinguish between two separate groups. I see this clearly. For instance, notice in verse 1, he writes, let us go on. In verse 2 he writes, and this we will do. Then verse 4 he says, it is impossible for those. Verse 6, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify. In verse 9 it says, we are confident of better things concerning you. Verse 10, God is not unjust to forget your works. So, I want us to make sure this morning that by the end of this teaching, we will have secured ourselves, that we are part of the us and we and you group, and that we are not part of the they and them that he is speaking about here. People will look at these verses and ask uh, the one spoken of, the people who are impossible to repent, uh, were they saved or are they not saved? Is this a group of people that were actually saved or not saved? And I can only say that the answer is right there in the verse. Apparently not. <laughs> Apparently they're not saved because it says it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. If somebody is impossible to renew to repentance, are they saved or not saved? So you have to look at this and you could say, these people are not saved. You know, Jesus speaks of the seed of the gospel falling upon soil of the heart. You remember this? And he gives different soils. And at one point, he says that there is some seed that falls on ground and it springs up immediately. Oh, I want Jesus. Oh, I believe that. Oh, I'll answer an altar call. Oh, let me pray that prayer. It springs up right away. But then Jesus said, but it does not take root and it quickly withers and dies. Jesus also speaking to the churches in the book of Revelation. So we know he's talking to believers. Jesus is talking to a bunch of believers. And he says to them in the book of Re Revelation. That they are to persevere to the end. Want to see me? Want to be blessed? <laughs> persevere to the end. There's no giving up in faith. There's no turning back. We are to keep on keeping on. Who knows that? Keep on keeping on. And the fact that we keep on keeping on proves who we are. The fact that we keep on keeping on shows that we have truly put our faith in Christ. Just like not persevering to the end shows also what is in the heart. Now, look, I think that the devil loves to give Bible studies. <laughs> Is that a funny thing to say? I do. I believe that he particularly likes to take the immature. He likes to beat you to death with these verses. And he likes to say, you're the one that these verses are about. He likes you to read these verses and say, give up. You've gone too far. 
You've lost your salvation. Cross over to the dark side. Oh, wait a minute, that's Star Wars. <laughs> but it's the same kind of an idea, and truly the devil is the dark side, to be sure. If you're worried, if you're worried that you may have lost your salvation, if you are concerned and find yourself somehow convicted, I did a bad thing, God has left me, I'm all alone, I'm lost, then guess what? That means your heart is still soft and you can repent and you can receive the gospel of grace. Look, the Bible is filled with a couple of words. Turn to the Lord and return to the Lord. As a matter of fact, there are far more return to the Lord's in the Bible than there are turn to the Lord. If that's you, then I say seize the moment. You feeling convicted? You think this might be you? This is how warnings in the Bible work. Lord, don't let that be me. Lord, I'm seizing the moment. I commit my life fully to you. Look at, even the Lord said the following through the prophet Hosea 14.4. God says, I will heal their backsliding. So God loves the backslider. I will love them freely, God says, for my anger has turned away. God's anger is turned away in who? In Jesus Christ. His anger is turned away. Have I, I've sinned. I did this terrible thing. I'm deserving of the wrath of God. But in Christ Jesus, all of God's anger is turned away. Why is it turned away? Does it mean God says, well, he's not so bad after all. He's a pretty good egg. I kind of like him. I like the way he dresses. I like his new haircut. He doesn't do any of those things. It says God will turn away his anger because he has turned his anger onto who? His beloved son upon the cross. That's why God turns away his anger. If so if you're wondering if you've lost your salvation, I would say uh, uh, take care of that right now. And good, thank you for helping her with that. <laughs> you could easily state that over and over again, one of the big messages of the Bible is repent. In fact, when Jesus started out his earthly ministry, what one word did he use? He used the word repent. Repent means make a U-turn. Repent means God is waiting. Repent says, I realize that my life is garbage. This is bad stuff, Lord. I want what you have for me. Let me be a total radical in Jesus Christ. I, I believe F.B. Meyer hit it well when he wrote the following. This passage has nothing to do with those who fear, lest it condemn them. The presence of that very anxiety, like the cry which betrayed the real mother in the days of Solomon. You remember that? Whose baby is this? Solomon says, I'll cut it in half. The fake mom said, good idea. <laughs> the real mom says, do not cut that baby in half. Give that baby away. That's how he knew it was who the real mom was. So just like the cry which betrayed the real mother in the days of Solomon establishes beyond a doubt that you are not one who has fallen away beyond the possibility of renewal to repentance. Look, I do not think that the question should be, can I lose my salvation? I don't, I don't think, I, I don't like that question. What I think the question should be is, were you saved in the first place? And if not, get saved today. <laughs> and if you've gone, come back. One of the most precious of pictures in the Bible is the father pacing back and forth on the driveway looking down hoping that his son will return am I right and God says that's me waiting for you come back knock that off I got a real life for you come to me it amazes me how close 
and how much information and how much enlightenment somebody can have and still not be rooted and grounded and saved in Christ Jesus. Let me read these again. Once enlightened, have tasted of the heavenly gift, have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. By all outward appearances, we might say, that sure sounds like a Christian to me. In fact, I think somebody like that might make a good deacon or elder in the church. <laughs> Their experience is impressive. Yet one can have great spiritual experience and still not be saved. Case in point, Judas. And from God's perspective, none of us can say that it's impossible to repent. Only God knows the heart. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. The will of the Father in heaven is for you to believe in Jesus Christ. Many will say to me in that day, the day of judgment, when everybody's raised from the dead, everybody great and small, everybody in heaven, everybody on earth, everybody under the earth, everybody will stand before Jesus Christ, and you will see it, and I will see it. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? Didn't we go to Calvary Chapel Life? <laughs> and I will declare to them, I never knew you. That's pretty heavy, isn't it? I believe that these challenging verses are best understood when kept in the context of particularly of the first two verses it is directed to Hebrews regarding some who had retreated from Christ back into ritual practices and had confined their beliefs solely to Judaism to the exclusion of Jesus entirely and within those confines of that structure alone all the religious repentance under Judaism in the world all the animal sacrifices in the world all the good works in the world will do them no good they have indeed taken a position Jesus is not the Messiah Jesus is not my high priest he is not the one mediator between God and man. And so what he is saying they do is they end up holding hands with the Roman appointed Pilate and the high priests who had plotted Jesus' death and they're rejecting him just like that. They think that putting Jesus Christ to death on the cross will end their dealings with him once and forever. By the way, it's, it, it, it's interesting, the wordage, if you look at it uh, without the help of the uh, Bible translators, as good as they are and as much help as they want to get of, give us. Verse 6, uh, take a look at it. Here's how, uh, get out some of your literal translations. If they fall away, Hebrews back to the religious practice of Judaism solely rejecting Christ to renew them again to repentance they crucify for themselves the son of God that's what it says it's not since they and it's not uh, again it may be implied in the sentence but those words aren't there. The, 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 the translators were just trying. It's, he, what he's saying is, they might as well have been right there with Pilate. And the, look, I think, look, this, let's just suppose this is, I'm going to pick a number, 64 AD. Let's just suppose it's 64 AD when they're reading this. There are some there who yelled, crucify Christ. 
There are some there who may have been little kids when Jesus came in to the Mount of Olives and they yelled, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So this is a very particular group. I, I can't... I don't think it should be read any other way than that. I think it should be approached simply and not made to be something that it's not. They thought their dealings with Christ was over. A lot of people think their dealings with Christ is over. It is not. It will not happen. Listen to what we've already studied in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13 says this, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him, the living word of God, to whom we must give an account. Let me make one more distinction here. Which is that falling, which is something we all do. If you're here and you're fallen, you've fallen into some sin, you've fallen, then all you need to do is go to the Lord and confess your sin. And John the Beloved says he's faithful and just to forgive you of all your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That, that's the God that we serve. So that's falling and falling is different than falling away. There is falling and there is falling away. Proverbs 24 verse uh, 13 says... It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, put it up there. Uh, Proverbs, I don't know what it is now. 16? <laughs> it's either 16 or 13. One of those. One of those. Uh, you know what? I, somebody, somebody tell me what Proverbs 16 is. Look that at Proverbs 24, 16. Somebody really quick with quick hands is going to look that up right now. And they're going to they're gonna sing it out to me. Uh, it has to do with a righteous uh, somebody falling. For a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by commandment. Yeah, see, the the you could fall seven times. I think that's in a day. I think that's uh, sometimes in a moment. But God's still going to lift you back up. Don't you re look? Uh, uh, Peter said there is no scripture that is of private interpretation. Now that, let me tell you what that does not mean. That does not mean that you can individually decide how to translate a particular verse, which we do that here all the time. <laughs> That's what teaching is. Here's a verse, here's what it means. But what that is saying is no verse can be taken privately without the context of the rest of the verses. So if I'm going to talk about forgiveness, I'm going to talk about repentance, I'm going to talk about returning to God, then I have to look at all the, what the Bible says about repenting and returning to God and being forgiven of sins. So this is a very particular thing that's happening here. It has been stated that, that this very thing, falling and falling away, is the difference between Peter and Judas. Peter fell. Judas fell away. And here's the consequences then of falling away. Verse 7, uh, explanation and consequences for the earth. It's almost like the writer, very much like Jesus, would give a teaching and then give a parable. This is very, this is very Jesus here. <laughs> I love it. So he gives the teaching and then he says, for the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated, receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. The rain which falls down is the gospel. It's the word of God. It's the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. Don't you think the Holy Spirit is tapped on people's shoulders? And said, it's me, I'm here, I love you. Come on, let's go. I don't want it. No, Jesus, no. The gospel falls like rain upon ears of everybody who's ever walked in here and heard me preach the word of God. That's the rain is falling. And if the rain falls upon a heart 
and there is no fruit. Nothing grows there. Nothing spiritual happens. If you were a doctor and you put on the, you know, the stethoscope and you were able to hold it spiritually to a heart that had the rain of the gospel fall upon it and there's no heartbeat. It's dead. There's no spiritual life. If the ground has been blessed by God, by the rain of God's revelation of who Jesus Christ, of His love and of the Holy Spirit, if that ground refuses refuses to bear fruit then who can blame the farmer who says burn down those thorns and thistles by the way would you like to keep from falling away I, I can show you how Jesus gives the prescription to keep from falling away want to know what it is somebody say yes <laughs> John chapter 15 verses 5 and 6 Jesus says I am the vine you are the branches he who what word abides in me and I in him bears much fruit there's somebody who's going to receive the rain and do something with it didn't we talk about dull of hearing last week it's the same thing Receive the rain. Start bearing fruit then. For without me you can do nothing. Not by works. Not by laying on of hands. Not by baptisms. Not by any of those things. Please let's go beyond that stuff now. Because he says if anyone does not abide in me. He is cast out as a branch. And it withers. And they gather them up. And they throw them into the fire. And they are burned. Church family, people that I know and love, abide in Christ. Abide in Christ, would you? Don't give up. Persevere to the end. God has good plans for you. He says, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for good and not for evil. To bring you a future. To bring you hope. Abide in Christ. Keep maturing. Don't take then the rain. Don't take the teaching of the word of God for granted. When we're teaching here. When something's coming out of our church family, Sunday mornings, Wednesday midweek, Friday life group Bible study, the rain is falling, and the farmer is looking for fruit. He's looking for maturity. He's looking for growth. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 13 says, All things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. Same thing. Light, the rain, the word of God, the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. For whatever makes manifest is light. Take your stuff to God. God turns it into light from dark to light. Therefore, he says, Awake! <laughs> you who sleep, Arise from the dead. Dead works. Dead ground. And Christ will give you light. Verse 9 says, But beloved... Oh my gosh. See, I have to stop. So, the, are these, these are hard verses, aren't they? Boy, they take, these are whammers right here, I'll tell you. But you get to verse 9. It says, But beloved... Who needed to hear that word today from God? <laughs> Beloved. <laughs> Don't you love it? God looking at you and looking at me and knowing our condition and everything we've said and what we've done and how we've fallen and how we've walked away from time to time and how we've gotten into fixes and how we've got dumb things that we've done. And yet God, your Father, looks at you and says, Beloved. 
Oh, I, I, I tell you, I just want to wrap that around, around me like a comforting blanket. God calls me his beloved. It's like John, he's called John the Beloved, and he says, I'm, you know me, I'm talking about myself, he says in the Gospels, you know me, the, the one who God loves. <laughs> very humbly, I believe he says that, and very humbly, I believe everybody should say that. You know me, the one who God loves. Not perfect, but God loves me. He says, but beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Not the they and the them. I am standing here before you, pastor, and I'm saying to you, I am confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation. Things that don't give salvation, things that accompany salvation. I'm saved by grace through faith. But there are things that accompany salvation. Well, oh, those would be good works. Service to the Lord. <laughs> I want to serve God. Submitting yourself to the authority of the leaders within the church. That's fruit. <laughs> So you have uh, uh, the leaders that are the ushers and the leaders that are Sunday school teachers, the leaders that are in hospitality. If they say, I want it done this way, guess what you should do? Do it that way. That's fruit. Things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. He, <laughs> though I have just spoken so severely to you, he is saying. Perhaps I've spoken too harshly to you, he is saying, with that warning. But I do expect that you will persevere to the end. And that way you will show who you are in Christ, that you are indeed in him and he is in you. Verse 10, 11, and 12. For God is not unjust to forget your works. What works is he talking about? Didn't he just say in verse 2, repentance what? From dead works. Repentance from works that you think will give you salvation. Aren't we past that yet? But by the way, if you have done good works, God's not going to forget those. He's not going to forget the labor of love, which you have shown towards his name in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. Do you know, Christian, that as you grow in Christ, so grows your assurance? Maybe when you first give your life to Christ, you got a little bit of assurance. Well, I, I think I'm, I, I, I'm saved. I, yeah, I'm following Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you mess up and you go, oh my gosh, am I still following Christ? You go back to the word. The rain falls. Yes, you're mine. I promise you, God says, that the work that I've begun in you, I'm going to complete it. You hear Jesus say, persevere to the end. You say, Jesus, I'm persevering to the end. You, you hear the Bible say, uh, it's not by works that you're saved, but by your faith. That's what saves you. Oh, yes, Lord. I put my, my assurance grows a little bit more. I heard Billy Graham interviewed. This was a few years back. And uh, <coughs> I think it was Larry King. And he says to him, uh, So, Billy. Now, anyway, uh, if you remember Larry King. He says, So, Billy, do you, do, you feel, do you still think you're going to heaven? His answer was interesting. He says, More so than ever before. Christian, you still think you're going to heaven? M more so than ever before. Because it says here, Show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope of receiving salvation, eternal life, glorification until the end that you do not become sluggish. That's that same kind of thing about dull of hearing. The rain's been falling on you. The rain's been falling. Sometimes somebody will say, man, Pastor Paul, man, thank you for that teaching, or I was really enlightened by it, or, you know, the scriptures came alive. I, I'm like, oh, praise God. God's good. His word's awesome. But internally, what I'm thinking when somebody says that is, oh God, let it bring forth fruit in their life. 
and fruit that remains. And when I sometimes when I see somebody wandering, I do get upset. Not that, look, I'm nobody. I don't care if I'm rejected. <laughs> I got Jesus. <laughs> but I get, I get upset and I go, don't do that. Stop it. I get this bad habit of, okay, this is a really bad habit. <laughs> if I get a cut or bruise or something, I, I pick on it. Just, you know, stop that, you know. And so uh, I, we went. To, we were at the doctor's, and, and uh, it's a regular checkup, and I'm fine. And Gigi goes, uh, 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 "Oh, show show her that that scra- scab you've been picking on." This. So I showed her the scab, and she looks at it, and she goes, "Are you picking on this?" <laughs> I was like, I felt like I was a kid again, and my mom was saying, "Are you picking?" And she looks at me, and she says, "Don't do that." <laughs> that, that's how I feel. That, that's the only thing that I feel. Who cares about me? I'm worried about you. Don't do that. Don't be sluggish. Let the rain fall. Let it produce an, a, an abundance of, of obedience to Christ. Show your faith. That's what... That's, that's why James sounds so mad in the book of James, you know. <laughs> he says, uh, you say you have faith? Good for you. <laughs> and he goes on to say, I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> I'll show you my works <laughs> that come from my faith. We desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience, those who through faith and patience, not good works, not any of those things listed in verse 2, those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. The promise of salvation, the promise of eternal life, the promise of help when you need it, the promise of Jesus being your high priest. I don't need the other high priest. I got Jesus. He's an imitator. I got the real thing. <laughs> oh, I, I really love the uh, the words to the hymn "In Christ Alone." Is anybody familiar with that song? I think Mick has sung it here a couple, two, three times, and uh, boy, those words are just. Beautiful. Here, let me read just the first verse. It says, In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, who is Jesus, this solid ground, faith, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love what depths of peace when fears are stilled when striving cease my comforter my all in all here is the here in the love of Christ I stand let's pray Father I thank you so much for today and I thank you for these powerful verses and the warning within them And I pray, Father, that we would be a church known by you as not being sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises of God. Bless each person here. Lay your hand upon them now, O Holy Spirit. Thank you for your presence here right now, Lord. Thank you for your peace right now. Holy Spirit, let your rain fall right now. Holy Spirit, speak to hearts. Tell them. Call them beloved. I thank you, Lord God, that salvation is ours through faith in Christ. Lord Jesus, be my Lord, be my Savior, be my friend. 
I will serve you and I will keep on keeping on. I will persevere to the end. For we pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name and all my dear brothers and sisters say,